I'm the conservation director for Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, and I oversee all of our uh, national policy work and our work with uh, government relations. And here today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Clean Water Act. I wanted to describe a little bit about the Clean Water Act and get us started there. Talk about an administrative rule change that's taking place that would replace uh, a previous rule implemented in 2015 under the Obama administration and then set things up for a little question and answer session. First and foremost, the Clean Water Act was established in 1972. The Clean Water Act was a piece of legislation passed by Congress. Rulemaking processes are administrative procedures that sometimes augment and change the way that uh, legislation is interpreted and implemented at the administrative level. And, and that's ultimately what we're talking about with you all today. Um, in 2015, we saw uh, the culmination of a, of a years in making rule process conducted under the Obama administration for the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to uh, pull together a bunch of public comments and put together a rule that addressed some uncertainty in the way we interpreted waters of the United States. And, and those waters of the United States are some of our most important waters. So we're talking ephemeral streams, which uh, only flow after uh, rain events and weather events. And so they're, they're not always flowing. There's intermittent streams, which have seasonal flow fluctuations. And so if you live in the West and, and you have snowpack in the springtime that begins to melt, you know, some of those headwater streams are flowing at certain times of the year, but at the end of summer, early fall, before we uh, get more moisture again, Sometimes they're dried up and they're not always flowing. And so there was a bit of a, a confusion created with how some of those were interpreted for being included in jurisdiction in the Clean Water Act. And, and since then, we've been living in a state of limbo until 2015 when protections were restored to the status quo essentially prior to those Supreme Court decisions. So there was a a Supreme Court justice named Kennedy, uh, for those of you that are familiar with your Supreme Court justices, good for you, you know Justice Kennedy. Uh, take a look at his opinion there. There was uh, something called uh, uh, nexus to uh, waters and taking a look at hydrological and ecological nexus to waters. That was the basis for the 2015 rulemaking called Waters of the United States to uh, restore protections to adjacent wetlands and intermittent streams and ephemeral streams. And it was great. Uh, for the first time ever, they also spelled out specific exemptions for agricultural practices to put uh, our friends in the farming and ranching community at ease. We don't wanna regulate your ditches. We don't wanna regulate the puddle in your driveway. We just wanna do good work for clean water and keep it at that. And, and so while that was a practice prior to 2015, there was some uh, concern in the agriculture and ranching community about those uh, definitions, possibly creating jurisdictions over their properties and their normal farming practices. And so they went out of their way to specifically exempt them from the Clean Water Act so that anyone that's a normal farmer or rancher, you don't have to worry about your, your, uh, your ditch lines being regulated or your crop production or anything like that. Uh, so it was a great thing. And we finally had certainty again. And, and now the current administration has decided to sort of erode that certainty and put us back to not just where we were before, but rewind the clock, jump in your back to the future time machine and take us way back to pre-Reagan days. They've narrowed the definition in their proposal so much, uh, really taking a look at the minority opinion from Justice Scalia before and, and retooling what they consider waters of the United States. Under the current administration's proposal for EPA and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, ephemeral streams, like I mentioned before, those important waterways that uh, only flow after rain events, which are incredibly important to fish and wildlife, by the way, and if you don't have great habitat for fish and wildlife, you don't have great hunting and fishing opportunities. Oh, and by the way, in case you didn't remember, water flows downstream and into bigger bodies of water, and guess where we get our clean water or clean drinking water from? You got it, you guessed it, 100%. Now we're uh, completely excluding ephemeral streams, leaving them open to pollution, and, and now there's been some uh, questions raised in the proposal around intermittent streams and what those even mean, and what 
Uh, will the administration do going forward with those intermittent streams that have seasonal flow fluctuations, which are also incredibly important to fish and wildlife in wetlands. And speaking of wetlands, now at least 50% of existing uh, protective wetlands would go away. Uh, some, are, some are putting out there 51% as a, as a mark for the number of wetlands. It's difficult to gauge because uh, the, the new proposal eliminates protections for wetlands if they don't have a significant connection to a jurisdictional body of water. So basically if a wetland's not immediately adjacent to a river that the administration acknowledges is under the protection of the Clean Water Act under their new narrow definition, then that wetland is excluded entirely. And, and that could mean the difference between a, a berm between a wetland and the river next door and the, there's no connection there. But I know that all of you are smarter than that and know that wetlands and waters are complicated networks and inextricably connected in complex ways under the surface where you can't see at times. And the fluctuations in, in wetlands and rivers and streams, regardless if they're ephemeral or intermittent, are all important to uh, advancing protections for clean water and ensure that our water stays clean for fish and wildlife, hunting and fishing, but also when you go to the tap, Shameless Yeti plug here, but I'm drinking cold, clean water, and uh, and it's hard to say that it's going to happen by accident. I think it it's incumbent upon all of us to take this responsibility, to pay attention to what's going on, stand up and do your part. Uh, certainly, we have a lot of partners helping us get there, but I just wanted to not keep this too long and rambling. Maybe we can do a, a series of these, maybe a segment, drill in deep in some of the weeds based on some of your questions. Um, but the, going back to the administration's current proposal, eliminating the Justice Kennedy opinion about significant nexus to waters and narrowing that down to uh, only having some type of surface connection really uh, eliminates incredible fish and wildlife habitat from being uh, uh, protected under the Clean Water Act. It's no longer under jurisdiction under the current administration's proposal. So. If you live in a state like Colorado, where I do, we're coming to you live here from the, the Pine Junction, Colorado headquarters of VHA. Uh, we have a ton of those waters. I was looking at our, our great partners over at Trout Unlimited. They've done some phenomenal uh, scientific research and study, and, and they, they, they do these awesome maps. You should go to TU's website at, at tu.org and check out their Waters of the United States work. In Colorado, 55% of the stream miles within native trout historical range are classified as intermittent or ephemeral, and 62% of those stream miles are headwater streams. If you like to fish the upper Arkansas like I do, 68% of those streams are intermittent, and 63% are headwaters. That's a lot of water we're looking at that would no longer be protected. And, and when we look at what types of activities occur that could potentially pollute these waters, we're largely not talking about agricultural practices. We're talking about things like uh, for uh, transportation projects, real estate development, a lot of industrial scale activities. So pretty important to protect these really sensitive waters. And we're pro mining, we're pro development, we're pro uh, balanced use. We can make sure that we have the ability to uh, develop lands and resources in a responsible way. Our multiple use mandate doesn't mean every use in every place, right? And if we erode the best possible habitat and push fish and wildlife into more marginal habitats, guess what? Hunting and fishing opportunity trends with population numbers. And if we see fish and wildlife population declines, that's a loss of loss of access in a lot of ways and none of us want to see that i don't know about you all but i get fired up if someone gets in the way of my hunting and fishing and so that's why we're so fired up about this rule and don't take my word for it like i said before go to try to limit his website look at these amazing maps that they've done they haven't done a map for every single state in the country but they have a lot of them and it's incredible and their science team has done amazing work there if you want to learn more about the the public polling that trcp's done the show a tremendous amount of support for the Clean Water Act and the protections it brings. Go visit our friends over at the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. See what they have to offer. They have great information on their website on this. National Wildlife Federation has been in the clean water game for a long time and followed this 
uh, at a legal and scientific level for a long time, they have incredible resources. You should do everything in your power, your fingertips in front of your computer today to go out and get the answers on your own. Don't take my word for it. I'm shooting you straight. I don't have any specific motivation other than to ensure my hunting and fishing traditions are here, they stay here, my kid gets to hunt, her kid gets to hunt, and it's there and it endures in a way that is meaningful and we're providing a, a really strong example of stewardship going forward. That's our only interest here. There's no financial interest, but there are certain financial interests out there that would like to develop some of these places. And I am not interested in exploring what's right or wrong with any of that. All I care about is making sure fish and wildlife habitat's good and strong and that we've got good clean water to pull out of the tap. I've been talking with our friends over at New Belgium Brewery. Apparently, great beer needs clean water too. And so you see all the crap brewers and the brewing industry getting into this big time too. They're very concerned about it. I saw a presentation uh, recently as well that I, I found really uh, pretty incredible. It was, um, it was conducted by the American Fisheries Society and they've done a lot of work to identify the connectivity of waters, but they've also taken a look at uh, intermittent streams and ephemeral streams in particular, and uh, one in particular in Colorado, Cottonwood Creek. Uh, I'm down in the Gunnison area fishing all the time. That place is important spawning habitat for a number of native fishery species. And if we lose protections there, that opens the door for pollution there too. So, so check those guys out too and see all the great work they've done and learn more on your own. Uh, you know, vote with your, your fingers, vote with your mouse, be active, be engaged, be a citizen. If you like what we're saying and what we're doing and you wanna help us out, go to our, our bio link, take you to our website. We've got a, an active feed going in to submit public comments to the Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. You can let them know how you feel about this. The comment period ends April 15th, so make sure you get after it right now. Uh, we need your help. Uh, TU's got an active alert. Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership has an active alert. And uh, National Wildlife Federation has an active alert. And I'm sure a number of other organizations do too. Take all their alerts, make comments everywhere, and do your part as a citizen to, to jump in and be a part of the process. Um, I'm gonna leave it there and like open the door for questions and, and uh, see how this goes, so. Okay. Uh... I'm reading some comments here. You guys feel free to jump in and, and, uh, and ask me some questions. And I'll do my best to answer them. And if I can't answer them, uh, you can email me at gale, G-A-L-E, at backcountryhunters.org. And I'll do my best to get back to you. And of course, uh, those organizations I mentioned that we've been working with, uh, Isaac Walton League is doing amazing work. Go check those guys out too. They've got an active alert up there too. Um, be on top of your game and check in with those organizations too. If I can't help you, one of them definitely can. And, uh, and there's definitely smarter people working on this than, than me and BHA. But uh, together, I think if we put our shoulder into the wheel, we'll, we'll make it happen and we'll do good things to make sure that our clean water stays that way. Ah, here's a question. Is the main concern that wetlands will get developed? Absolutely. You know, if you're, if you're out there looking at the rate at which wetlands are currently disappearing, we had a great... Uh, plateau in there and the Clean Water Act is, is uh, due in large part of the success of, of wetland restoration. But uh, we haven't had declines in wetlands for a long time. Now we're seeing massive declines annually and uh, an area the size of Central Park is disappearing from the continent every single year. That's why it's important that we have protections like the Clean Water Act in place. These waters are not going to protect themselves and we got to do our part to make sure that that people are doing their part to make sure we hold people accountable. Um, if if uh, the honor system worked, uh, we wouldn't need legislation, we wouldn't need administration, but unfortunately it doesn't work that way and not everyone feels the same way we do about uh, clean water and, and, um, and protection and regulation and things like that. We feel like the 2015 rule is a balanced approach to doing it and the current administration hasn't really provided any scientific evidence about why their rulemaking is even needed in the first place. So we're scratching our heads a little bit, but it's going to happen with or without us. So we want to make sure that it, uh, it is as strong as it possibly can be without being restrictive to good people like farmers and ranchers out there just trying to do their thing.
Um, any scientific studies to support these changes or rollbacks? None that I've seen, um, and I could be wrong. Uh, I, someone give me a chance to prove me wrong, send us information that supports any of these rollbacks, but taking steps backwards and rewinding the clock and jumping in the time machine doesn't seem to make sense for any policy on any level where you're talking about natural resources or not. The modern, the modern era, the number of people that, that live in our country, the impact on resources, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to do what we can to march forward and be more thoughtful and put policies in place that are forward looking and help us maintain uh, the, the balance that we need with resource extraction, but also look to the future and model sustainability so that we're passing a sense of stewardship on to our kids and grandkids in the future, not really the time to rewind the clock and go backwards. And so we we'll hope we will move forward. See, we got a question here. Is the EPA ignoring its own connectivity report? That's a fantastic question. The EPA itself has done incredible science and research in the development of the 2015 Waters of the United States rulemaking, and their connectivity report specifically demonstrates that wetlands and waterways are inextricably connected. And there are a number of uh, really cool graphs and pictures uh, out there that show like how intermittent and ephemeral streams connect to larger bodies of water, even though they don't flow all the time. When they are flowing, it's incredibly important. And fish and wildlife depend on those during some of the most sensitive parts of their life cycle. So it's important. Uh, we got another question. What can the hunters and fishing community do to help? Well, I've already kind of mentioned a couple of ways that you guys can help us out, but the, the best way you can probably help as an individual citizen is to take part in this public comment process. Go to the websites, go to the Isaac Walton League, go to Trout Unlimited, go to the National Wildlife Federation, go to BHA's website, go to TRCP and TU's websites. We can all work together to make sure that we have our voices heard. And the more that we engage in the public process and let the administration know that we care about these places in the right way and clean water, that's, that's the best thing we can possibly do. And, and pointing people to the science and dispelling myths that the Trump administration is just rolling back uh, administrative overreach by the Obama administration. There was no overreach at all in that rulemaking process. They were restoring protections that were there before the Obama administration even existed. Restoring loss protections is commendable and they actually went out of their way to spell out exemptions for the agriculture industry doing more than any other administration had done before to ensure that our working land stay working and the good farmers and ranchers in America don't have anything to worry about. The new rulemaking process is, is underreach at its possible worst. And I think that the more we can do together to dispel some of those myths and, and let our fellow hunters and anglers know that this is not a good rulemaking process and it has no motivations in science rationale and the way they're trying to move it forward so quickly undermining the public process uh smells like they want to get it done fast and get it over with so that they can move on and i don't know about you guys but this stuff's way too important to sweep under the rug and move so quickly on particularly when we have a great 2015 rule to look to and improve upon. If the administration wants to do anything, they should improve upon the 2015 rule and make things even stronger. Uh, how about a joint hearing before Congress with BHA Trout Unlimited to educate the congressional hearing? That's a great question too. I think that if the rulemaking does move forward, we may have to rely on some type of congressional intervention and it's hard to say what the appetite of Congress is to do that, but I think it's something important for us to explore and look at. And if all of you are, are able to reach out to your members of Congress, it's definitely worth giving them a call. Call their office, send them an email, let them know how you feel about this rulemaking process, put it on their radar screen. If they're not hearing from their constituents about it, in their minds it means that it must not be that big a deal. So. I think members of Congress can be very helpful, and at some point in time, maybe there would be a hearing. How do you relate the views of our new Secretary of Interior, David Bernhardt? Oh, uh, Secretary, well, Acting Secretary Bernhardt hasn't been confirmed yet. 
by the Senate, uh, hasn't really expressed any views uh, on the on the rulemaking process, but uh, we want to give uh, Secretary Bernhardt every chance to weigh in on that, and we certainly hope that uh, he'll use his uh, bully pulpit as Secretary Interior um, to help influence what his colleagues over at EPA and Army and Corps of Engineers are doing, and and perhaps uh, if he's hearing from hunters and anglers and, and we're uh, letting him know how important it is to us and the fish and wildlife habitat that exist on the public lands that his, uh, his agency manages, maybe, maybe that'll help. So good idea. Uh, John, will the federal navigability laws change in the new Clean Water Act? Uh, great question. The rulemaking process does not address federal navigability laws. Uh, what they do address is uh, jurisdictions of federal waters and, and essentially going after Justice Kennedy's uh, significant nexus argument and replacing it with a very narrow minority opinion from Justice Scalia that talks about only having a surface connection to jurisdictional waters. So the navigability laws uh, uh, aren't going to uh, go away or, or be adjusted in any way. So good, good question there. Um, what else we got here? Uh, can you repeat the stats? What percentage of fishing waters and hunting lands would be impacted? Great question. So uh, depending on where you go and what you look at, um, we're looking at at least 50%, at least half of the wetlands currently protected under the Clean Water Act and the 2015 rule would go away altogether. Um, and the number of streams and headwater streams by 18%, uh, 18% may not sound like a huge number, but when you consider that those headwater streams, those ephemeral and intermittent streams, and those uh, wetlands are responsible for the most important part of our drinking water system, those headwaters need to be clean. If they are polluted, that stuff runs downstream. We don't want that running into our taps, and we certainly don't want it impacting fish and wildlife habitat. And whether you're a waterfowl hunter in the prairie pothole region, and wetlands are what you live and breathe every day, or you're a trout fisherman and you're, you're out exploring the headwaters of every stream you can find because you love catching those little native brookies in West Virginia, or you're up in Pennsylvania and you're worried about coal mines. These things matter, and 18% is inexcusable. And I would ask you guys this question. What percent of clean water would you be willing to give up? Is 18% acceptable? I think anything more than 0% is unacceptable for wetlands or streams for hunting and fishing opportunity. I don't want to lose any percent of any of those. I want to gain percentages. I want to have new lands to hunt fish. I want to have more public access. I want to have as clean water as possible. Who's, who's against clean water? That's the fundamental question to ask. Like, why are people going after conservation groups and people that care about clean water? That's like going after people that have a problem with oxygen. Like we need these things. It's important to us. And, uh, and I don't know about you guys, but that's where I'm at. What else we got here? Oh, yeah. Uh, someone just mentioned the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. You're on your game there. Good comment there. Uh, we want to make sure our public lands are accessible and plentiful. We'll be donating a lot of money to some select charitable organizations in this effort. Well, uh, thank you, Toxic Flight. We uh, appreciate your support if any of that comes our way, but uh, please take a look at the partner organizations out there and uh, give your time, give your money, and uh, make sure that we're all in this together. And the more we are working together, the more we can do together. Uh, what do you think about increasing the ease of private access? I'm not sure what that question means exactly or or what, you're, what it's getting at, but um, you know, private access on private lands is uh, something that you know, we respect and, and this rule making process doesn't necessarily have anything to do with that, but what we don't wanna see is uh, anyone on private lands with private access polluting public waters. That's where we might have a problem with uh, people operating on private lands where they are polluting waters and, and that's the, the purpose of the whole permitting system under the Clean Water Act for fill and dredge is to make sure that those waters aren't polluted and whether you're a coal mining operation or oil and gas pipeline company or anyone else, 
let's do the right thing for the right reasons and be good stewards of the resource because there is a way that we can have our cake and eat it too. There is a way we can have our fish and fishing and a hunt and, and enjoy public lands and waters and make sure we have clean water coming out of the tap and still have real estate development and all these other industrial practices. That's the purpose of the 2015 rulemaking to achieve balance and do the right thing. And make sure we're not making silly decisions that we'll regret later or that our children and grandchildren will pay for. Uh, what do you think about farmed fish? I have a lot of thoughts about farmed fish. Why don't we save that one for another Instagram live event? And better yet, if you can make our rendezvous coming up the first weekend in May, head on over to Boise. We're going to have a cool panel talking about that very thing, farmed fish, uh, nadromous fisheries, all the issues that are important to us. So come on over and uh, we'll circle back to that. Why is the 2015 rule only in effect in 22 states? That's a great question. The 2015 rule was subject to a lot of litigation and the litigation hasn't been resolved yet. And so uh, the rule has been suspended from implementation in many states and states where there wasn't uh, uh, any litigation to prevent the rule from being implemented. It remains in effect until the new rulemaking process replaces the 2015 Waters of the U.S. rule. Great question and uh, important to think about. Certainly if this uh, Trump administration rulemaking process moves forward. We'll see even more litigation uh, happen across the way. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up here. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we appreciate everything that all of you do. Our success as a conservation community, as a hunting and fishing community, is only as strong as the amount of time that we all put into doing the right thing for the right reasons. So uh, please uh, make public comments on this process. We have till April 15th. Uh, go out and fish, go out and hunt, and go out and enjoy our wild public lands, waters, and wildlife. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll be sharing this. Check out our bio link for more on how you can take action. And please do visit our partner organizations and be engaged there too. Thanks a lot.